Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy by Warren Mosler Deadly Innocent Fraud Number 3 Federal Government Budget Deficits Take Away from Savings Fact Federal Government Budget Deficits Add to Savings Lawrence Summers Several years ago, I had a meeting with Senator Tom Daschle and then Assistant Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers. I had been discussing some these innocent frauds with the Senator and explaining how they were working against the well-being of those who voted for him. So he set up this meeting with the Assistant Treasury Secretary, who is also a former Harvard economics professor and has two uncles who have won Nobel Prizes in economics, to get his response and hopefully confirm what I was saying. I opened with a question. Larry, what's wrong with the budget deficit? He replied, it takes away savings that could be used for investment. I then objected, no it doesn't. All Treasury securities do is offset operating factors at the Fed. It has nothing to do with the savings and investment. To which he retorted, well, I really don't understand reserve accounting, so I can't discuss it at that level. Senator Daschle was looking on at all this in disbelief. This Harvard professor of economics, Assistant Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers, didn't understand reserve accounting. Sad, but true. So I spent the next 20 minutes explaining the paradox of thrift, more detail on this innocent fraud in number six later. Step by step, which he sort of got right when he finally responded, so we need more investment which will show up as savings? I responded with a friendly, yes, after giving this first year economics lesson to the good Harvard professor and ended the meeting. The next day, I saw him on a podium with the Concord Coalition, a band of deficit terrorists, talking about the grave dangers of the budget deficit. This third deadly innocent fraud is alive and well at the very highest levels. So here's how it really works, and it could not be simpler. Any U.S. dollar government deficit exactly equals the total net increase in the holdings, U.S. dollar financial assets, of the rest of us, businesses and households, residents and non-residents, what is called the non-government sector. In other words, government deficits equal increased monetary savings for the rest of us to the penny. Simply put, government deficits add to our savings, to the penny. This is an accounting fact, not theory or philosophy. There is no dispute. It is basic national income accounting. For example, if the government deficit last year was $1 trillion, it means that the net increase in savings of financial assets for everyone else combined was exactly to the penny one trillion dollars. For those who took some economics courses, you might remember that net savings of financial assets is held as some combination of actual cash, treasury securities, and member bank deposits at the Federal Reserve. This is Economics 101 and first year money banking. It is beyond dispute. It's an accounting identity. Yet, it's misrepresented continuously and at the highest levels of political authority. They are just plain wrong. Just ask anyone at the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, as I have, and they will tell you they must balance the checkbook and make sure the government deficit equals our new savings, or they would have to stay late and find their accounting mistake. As before, it's just a branch of spreadsheet entries on the government's own spreadsheet.
when the accountants debit subtract from the account called government when the government spends they also credit add to the accounts of whoever gets those funds when the government account goes down some other account goes up by exactly the same amount next it is an example of how operationally government deficits add to savings this also puts our, to rest a ridiculous new take on this innocent fraud that's popped up recently deficit spending means the government borrows from one person and gives it to another so nothing new is added it's just a shift of money from one person to another in other words they are saying that deficits don't add to our savings but just shift savings around this could not be more wrong so let's demonstrate how deficits do add to savings and not just shift savings one start with the government selling 100 billion dollars in treasury securities note this sale is voluntary which means that the buyer buys the securities because he wants to presumably he believes that he is better off buying them than not buying them no one is ever forced to buy government securities they get sold at auction to the highest bidder who is willing to accept the lowest yield two when the buyers of these securities pay for them checking accounts at the fed are reduced by 100 billion to make the payment in other words money in checking accounts at the fed is exchanged for the new treasury securities which are savings accounts at the fed at this point non-government savings is unchanged the buyers now have their new treasury securities as savings rather than the money that was in their checking accounts before they bought the treasury securities three now the treasury spends 100 billion after the sale of the 100 billion dollars of new treasury securities on the usual things government spends its money on four this treasury spending adds back 100 billion dollars to someone's checking accounts five the non-government sector now has its 100 billion of checking accounts back and it has the 100 billion of new treasury securities bottom line the deficit spending of 100 billion dollars directly added 100 billion of savings to the form of new treasury securities to non-government savings non-government means everyone but the government the savings of the buyer of the 100 billion dollars of new treasury securities shifted from money in his checking account to his holdings of the treasury securities savings accounts then when the treasury spent 100 billion dollars after selling the treasury securities the savings of recipients of that 100 billion dollars of spending saw their checking accounts increase by that amount so to the original point deficit spending doesn't just shift financial assets u.s dollars and treasury securities outside of the government instead deficit spending directly adds exactly that amount of savings of financial assets to the non-government sector and likewise a federal budget surplus directly subtracts exactly that much from our savings and the media and politicians and even top economists have it all backwards in july 1999 the front page of the wall street journal had two headlines towards the left was a headline praising president clinton and the record government budget surplus and explaining how well fiscal policy was working on the right margin was a headline stating that americans weren't saving enough and we would have to work harder to save more then the few a few pages later there was a graph with one line showing the surplus going up and another line showing the savings going down they were nearly identical but going in opposite directions and clearly showing 
the gains in the government surplus roughly equal the losses in private savings. There can't be a budget surplus with private savings increasing, including non-resident savings of U.S. dollar financial assets. There is no such thing, yet not a single mainstream economist or government official had it right. Al Gore Early in 2000, in a private home in Boca Raton, Florida, I was seated next to the then-presidential candidate Al Gore at a fundraiser dinner to discuss the economy. The first thing he asked was how I thought the next president should spend the coming $5.6 trillion surplus that was forecasted for the next 10 years. I explained that there wasn't going to be a $5.6 trillion surplus because that would mean a $5.6 trillion drop in non-government savings of financial assets, which was a ridiculous proposition. At the time, the private sector didn't even have that much in savings to be taxed away by the government, and the latest surplus of several hundred billion dollars had already removed more than enough private savings to turn the Clinton boom into the soon-to-come bust. I pointed out to candidate Gore that the last six episode per, the last six periods of surplus in our more than 200 year history had been followed by the only six depressions in our history. Also, I mentioned that the coming bust would be due to allowing the budget to go into surplus and drain our sur savings, resulting in a recession that would not end until the deficit got high enough to add back our lost income and savings and deliver the aggregate demand needed to restore output and employment. I suggested that the $5.6 trillion surplus, which was forecasted for the next decade, would more likely be a $5.6 trillion deficit, as normal savings desires are likely to average 5% of GDP over that period of time. That is pretty much what happened. The economy fell apart, and President Bush temporarily reversed it with his massive deficit spending in 2003. But after that, and before we had enough deficit spending to replace the financial assets lost to the Clinton surplus years, a budget surplus takes away exactly that much savings from the rest of us. We let the deficit get too small again. And after the subprime debt-driven bur bubble burst, we again fell apart due to a deficit that was and remains far too small for the circumstances. For the current level of government spending, we are being overtaxed, and we don't have enough after-tax income to buy what's for sale in that big department store called the economy. Anyway, Al was a good student went over all the details, agreeing that it made sense and was indeed what might happen. However, he said he couldn't go there. I told him that I understood the political realities as he got up and gave his talk about how he was going to spend the coming surpluses. Robert Rubin Ten years ago, around the year 2000, just before it all fell apart, I found myself in a private client meeting at Citibank with Robert Rubin, former U.S. Treasury Secretary under President Clinton, and about 20 Citibank clients. Mr. Rubin gave his take on the economy and indicated that the low savings rate might turn out to be a problem. With just a few minutes left, I told him I agreed about the low savings rate being an issue and added, Bob, does anyone in Washington realize that the budget surplus takes away savings from the non-government sectors? He replied, No, the surplus adds to savings. When the government runs a surplus, it buys, it buys treasury securities in the market, and that adds to savings and investment. To that, I responded, No. When we, we run a surplus, we have to sell our securities to the Fed cash in our savings accounts at the Fed to get the money to pay our taxes. And our net financial assets and savings go down by the amount of the surplus. Rubin stated, No, I, I think you're wrong. 
I let it go, and the meeting was over. My question was answered. If he didn't understand surpluses removed savings, then no one in the Clinton administration did, and the economy crashed soon afterwards. When the January 2009 savings report was released and the press noted that the rise in savings to 5% of GDP was the highest since 1995, they failed to note the current budget deficit passed 5% of GDP, which also happens to be the highest it's been since 1995. Clearly, the mainstream doesn't yet realize that deficits add to savings. And if Al Gore does, he isn't saying anything. So watch this year as the federal deficit goes up and savings, too, goes up. Again, the only source of net U.S. dollar monetary savings, financial assets, for the non-government sectors combined, both residents and non-residents, is U.S. government deficit spending. But watch how the very people who want to save more at the same time want to balance the budget by taking away our savings, either through spending cuts or tax increases. They are all talking out of both sides of their mouths. They are part of the problem, not part of the solution. And they are at the very highest levels, except for one. Professor Wynne Godley. Professor Wynne Godley, retired head of economics at Cambridge University and now over 80 years old, was widely renowned as the most successful forecaster of the British economy for multiple decades. And he did it all with his sector analysis, which had at its core the fact that the government deficit equals the savings of financial assets of the other sectors combined. However, even with the success of his forecasting, the ironclad support from the pure accounting facts and the weight of his office, all of which continues to this day, he has yet to convince the mainstream of the validity of his teachings. So now we know, federal deficits are not the awful things that the mainstream believes them to be. Yes, deficits do matter. Excess spending can cause inflation. But the government isn't going to go broke. Federal deficits won't burden our children. Federal deficits don't just shift funds from one person to another. Federal deficits add to our savings. So what is the role of deficits in regard to policy? It's very simple. Whenever spending falls short of sustaining our output and employment, when we don't have enough spending power to buy what's for sale in that big department store we call the economy, government can act to make sure that our own output is sold by either cutting taxes or increasing government spending. Taxes function to regulate our spending power and the economy in general. If the right level of taxation needs to support output and employment happens to be a lot less than government spending, that resulting budget deficit is nothing to be afraid of regarding solvency, sustainability, or doing bad by our children. If people want to work and earn money but don't want to spend it, fine. Government can either keep cutting taxes until we decide to spend and buy our own output and or buy the output, award contracts for infrastructure repairs, national security, medical research, and the like. The choices are political. The right size deficit is the one that gets us to where we want to be with regards to output and employment, as well as the size of government we want, no matter how large or how small a deficit that might be. What matters is the real life, output and employment, size of the deficit, which is an accounting statistic. In the 1940s, an economist named Abba Lerner called this functional finance and wrote a book by that name, which is still very relevant 
today.